My name's Leah Atwood, and I'm one of the cooperative directors for MESA. Um, I'm very honored and privileged and delighted to be with this panel for you this afternoon. Um, this, is, uh, this is the second time we've done this, this uh, topic at Soil Not Oil, and um, I think it is, it's such a crucial perspective to be part of this conversation. Um, the, it, we talk a lot about the implications of the food system being so fossil fuel dependent and so environmentally and climate devastating, but we get the chance to talk, or we don't get the chance, we make less effort, I think, to talk a lot about the more socio-political aspects of agroecology, and I think it's so crucial to have a, a global perspective in this and looking at the underlining causes that are connected. So our speakers are going to be sharing through a diversity of lenses, looking at the, the power structures that are um, desperately clinging onto the system status quo. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on MESA and our network and a little bit about the um, little, a little more explanation on, on the power systems we're talking about. And then I'm going to introduce the speakers and hand it over. Oh, it's too speedy for me. OK, so MESA's vision is a vision. It's a world where farmers and indigenous knowledge are celebrated as the heart of community resilience. And our theory of change is that to transform the food system in the face of a multinational food regime, that we need multinational grassroots organizing. And that needs to be, the values need to be placing the well-being of people and the planet above deep pocket profits. So this is our, our global heartbeat. This is what keeps us going. This is our community. And so MESA's role is through the horizontal exchange of strategies and food sovereignty and experiential learning and agroecology. We're connecting change makers to regenerate community food systems. And that's by linking ancestral knowledge and innovation that's rooted in earth stewardship fair economies, and multicultural alliances worldwide. So connect, this, this work is about connection, collaboration, and reviving each other. So our, our main key scopes of work are our global network, and this is partnering with grassroots organizations and social movements around the world. Um, to, for short and long-term knowledge exchanges. So fo folks from Via Campesina, from the MST, and these larger social movements, to smaller grassroots nonprofits, like Paul is going to share about from GBAC, the Grow Biointensive Institute in Kenya. And Second, we have a small grant and microfinance program that is supporting on-farm collaboration. And this is to help beginning farmers learn with experienced farmers that want to pass on their knowledge. And a farm-based social learning platform, I hope I'm not making you dizzy with this, um, which is an online platform that is integrating ecological production with socio-political activation and economic viability. And the goal is to amplify the voices that are already out there and organize it in a way that can make it really relevant for on-the-farm applied learning. So right now we have four courses, applied agroecology, organic seed production, um, and uh, the Bay Area Farmer Training Program and on-farm mentorship and about 700 online learners. And then our local food sovereignty mo mobilization, Anna Galvis is here. Anna, you want to raise your hand? <laughs> oh, there she is. So Anna is one of the educators for our Bay Area Farmer Training Program, which combines a three-month intensive in agroecology with mentorship, inter internship, seed grants, and eventually the formation of a worker-owned cooperative focusing on immigrants, formerly incarcerated individuals, women, and refugees. Okay, so <clears throat> this is hopefully a reminder. Has anyone not seen this slide? 
Okay, good. <laughs> so just looking at the concentration of and consolidation of power in the food supply, this is a really uh, compelling graphic. And um, the same goes with our seed system. And most of you know that we've lost an incredible amount of our biodiversity. And right now, I, over 75% of the global, food, global seed market is in the hands of uh, seven seed companies. And now, I guess, less because Monsanto and Bayer are merging. And so what we don't see so often are the faces behind <laughs> these corporations. And funny that they all look the same. So this is um, a really important element of like, what Bell Hooks about, talks about, that this is a, this is a white supremacist, neo-colonial, neo-liberal um, patriarchy, and capitalist patriarchy. And um, these are the, the fine gentlemen that are clinging so desperately. <clears throat> Um, so another way of saying that, that is pasty, oppressive, oligarchical patriarchy of the global food system. <laughs> so there's like, so it's poops, right? And we're going to talk about composting, so just bear with me. <laughs> so, um, and they are so intimately connected to one of the main food system crises of our time, um, which is land grabbing. And I think there's a really important parallel to talk about in the global, um, global uh, land grabbing and what's happening in our community here as well with people being, with, um, people being forced out of their communities because they can't afford to live in a place where rent is skyrocketing. And so you can see here where the majority of um, the land grabbing is taking place in Africa and Southeast Asia, but it is really worldwide. And so um, this is resulting in these kind of travesties where almost 8 million people are hungry. Um, this food system is built around industrial farming systems, the use of non-renewable, unsustainable inputs. The farm sector's debt to income ratio is the highest it's been in 30 years. It's exploitative of workers and we, the food system uses over a third of produces over the, a third of our greenhouse gases while using over 70% of our fresh water. And this, these statistics are less commonly known. This, is, um, this was a census, this is a slide that Anna put together, um, and looking at ownership of farms and operation of farms in the US. And so I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, so just take a look at that and, and see what you see. <clears throat> and so, we want to take these elements that the, the, the poops are, um, are resulting in, and we want, in, in this talk of resistance and regeneration, I think it can be, I think we get intimidated a lot about how to start, and that these structures are so huge that can they really, can we really break them down? And I think compost is the perfect analogy, because it is the formation of breaking things down and building something up, and we really need to be doing both simultaneously in order for any kind of transformation to happen. <clears throat> Okay, and I want to make sure that everyone has um, a good definition of, of food sovereignty and the difference between food sovereignty and food security. And this is a term coined by, by Via Campesina and that really hones in on you can't just, it's not just enough to have access, but to have control over your food system and be able to define it. Okay, um, I'm going to skip ahead here and just want to give note to the faces of the small farmers and women of color that make up the 70, over 70% 70 of the world's food producers, not those other guys. <laughs> and just in on this quote um, that uh, of our, our amazing um, thought leader and activist Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And this is so relevant today. And I want to thank our speakers for demanding this work and doing this work with such heart and tenacity and courage. 
Um, and so I'm going to introduce everyone at once, so I take up less time. But um, Paul Simu is a farmer from Kenya. <laughs> Paul has taught hundreds and worked alongside hundreds of farmers throughout East Africa, teaching agroecology and biointensive. And he's here in the U.S. for a year to do a learn and share exchange with a farmer from Mexico and a farmer from California. And um, I'll move down to Brandy Mack. Brandy, thank you so much for being here. She jumped in last minute when one of our speakers from Cuba who was stuck in the hurricane couldn't come. So you may have noticed on the, on the write-up that we have changed. But Brandy ha is an incredible activist. She is one of the directors of the, Mar the, Mar the Butterfly movement. I always want to call it Mariposa. <laughs> the Butterfly Movement. Um, she's a permaculture activist and trained um, by Starhawk. Um, and she's an, an incredible leader in our community. Thank you so much, Brandy, for being here. And Katie Hackmeyer. Katie is a full-time farmer and owner at Red H Farm. She's also a uh, professor at Sonoma State. She's been recognized by the FAO and uh, a, quite a long list of accomplishments. And she's an author and an activist and we're so grateful that Katie could also join us today last minute for the other, our other participant from Mexico who was not able to join us. <laughs> and last but not least, Anuradna Rasange from Sri Lanka. Um, uh, Aradna is a farmer and a uh, organizer for the participatory guarantee system in Sri Lanka, which is an alternative for organic third-party certification and used by iPhone. He, um, he grew up on a, his family's farm, and he's also one of the youth organizers at the Good Market, which he's going to tell you all about. So I will hand it over. Thank you. Good evening. Quite exciting. So I would like to share my experience on uh, Good Market Guarantee Limited with the PGS uh, experience. So this is a totally community driven uh, initiated initiative we have uh, we implemented in Sri Lanka to address the sort of problems which we faced uh, because of the new new emerging economies. So I'll give a brief introduction about me. So I grew up in a farm family, as Leah said. So I'm a part of MESA program for this year. I, I got the opportunity to participate in MESA internship program. And I'm working as a, uh, with smallholder farmers in the country, uh, consulting and helping them to build organic agricultural systems in the country. So in a nutshell about Sri Lankan agriculture, uh, we have the effect of colonization of British since 1796 and all our agricultural system changed to tea, rubber, coconut and cinnamon because so we lost our uh, traditional agricultural systems. So we, apart from that we produce locally uh, all the vegetables, grains and yams and major export crops are coconut tree, rubber and cinnamon and Average income is 948 uh, US dollars per annum. And uh, we suffered 30 years from a very devastating war, and now we are healing after 10 years. And we have an indigenous Vedda population, but they also threatened to extinct because of these globalization issues. So we face lots of challenges in, uh, in our food sovereignty and uh, our food consumption patterns. So I'll briefly explain those challenges. So we, because of our 30 years war, our uh, poverty line on the districts of uh, face for the war strictly affected, affected by poverty. 
and we have a huge influence by India. So we are very small, tiny little country, country below India, and India is 60 times bigger than Sri Lanka. So almost always, lots of products like which we could grow easily in Sri Lanka will come as imports products like chili, onions, and our local farmers have lots of troubles to sell their products at a reasonable price. So there's no uh, pre uh, market place for locally grown produce. Then we have a land issue because big agricultural corporations take, uh, they, are, they, uh, they are growing monoculture crops and they are grabbing uh, lands uh, in, the uh, in the country. Because of the big, uh, big uh, companies and big initiatives, there's a, we have a human elephant conflict because big companies, they have electric fences and they have lots of development technology. So they cover their uh, elephant corridors. So elephants uh, reduce their natural forest areas. Now they are coming and attacking the smallholder farmers. That's becoming an increasing problem in Sri Lanka. And on the other end, the all small farmers, they are losing their land due to infrastructure development and some other development activities in the country. So it's very hard for young people like us to find land for farming. So we are in a huge competition uh, because of this, all these issues. Then climate change also affecting us a lot in uh, present, uh, the, uh, present decades. Flood and uh, we face uh, floods and longer droughts. And due to high temperature, we have press problems emerging and large number of monoculture plantations are happening like corn, sugarcane, and banana. And we are losing our traditional f farming methods. Then because of 30 years war, we have lots of war widows in the northern part of the country. And as commonly as an uh, Asian culture, our lots of women, they stay at their homes and help in their family. So we wanted uh, another source of income generation pattern for the, especially for the women who are based in their homes and need to increase family income and nutrition. That's also uh, another uh, issue in Sri Lanka. So lack of uh, market opportunities for smallholder farmers, that's another problem because smallholder farmers, they produce in a small scale, but because their production scale doesn't match with the uh, bigger scale, so they are having issues to market their products. And because of this issue, there's lots of middlemen exploitation. Middlemen try to buy their products at a lower level, paying lower uh, margin for the uh, smallholder farmers. And another emerging challenge because of organic agriculture, third party bigger certifications companies, they make an awareness in the community, uh, organic produce should be certified by a company. So smallholder farmers, they can't afford because these uh, third party certifications are very expensive. And even if a farmer or farmer group afford for the certification, the products are very expensive. So this middle income level or lower income level consumers can't afford for the uh, products, certified product by a third party uh, uh, company, certification company. So we were looking for strategies how to overcome from these all the issues. So we identified farmer network and community created marketplace, marketplace will be solve these kinds of issues. So our main intention was to connect smallholder farmers and the consumers in a one stage. So then everybody have access to information, then everybody knows who is doing what, what and what is happening in the country and connect farmers and consumers, they can meet together. So good market is our concept. So we created a marketplace, equal uh, market slaves. So the, this is the market in this side. So it's eight to eight, all three, three, 360 all year, it's open, it's a shop. And this is an event, it's up happening in once a year, once a week in every Saturday, once, a week, once in a week. So farmers and consum consumers and producers, they get together and sell their products. That's a connecting uh, networking uh, procedure of the uh, people. So we started this concept in 2012. So initially there were 20 farmers and vendors. So all the farmers and vendors were only 20. 
So it was happening, the event was only happening at that moment. So it was a totally voluntary driven event at that moment. Then we wanted to alternative system for the third party certification. So we uh, identified PGS is the best solution. So we, uh, we introduced PGS at, uh, as an alternative solution for smallholder farmers and certification system. So it, uh, it's, this system consists of uh, producers and consumers. So consumers with a technical leader, they go and inspect all the farm fields uh, who applied uh, for the PGS certificate. Then a technical leaders, they inspect the field and they inspect all the documents and they give recommendations and we have the process to issue the certificate. So it's very low costly. I'm working as a technical leader, so I go and visit fields uh, uh, to educate and... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is a model, so we go and help, we meet the farm, uh, uh, we go and inspect farmers and issue the third party certification. The standards are pretty almost same for the third party certification, but it's very cheap and the consumers also can get a chance to go and see the fields and farms and they meet each other and they issue the certificate. So all the standards based from IFARM, or known as International Foundation for Organic Agricultural Movements. So it's uh, a movement uh, represent close to 800 farmers. We are 800 affiliated bodies. We are one of the body recognized by the IFOM among 117 countries in the world. So it uh, operates on the key, key PGS elements and follow organic agriculture princi principles all. So today, now we are very happy. We have more than 300 certified vendors in our journey at, uh, within this five years period. And we have more than 175 PGS certified farmers in the, uh, in the country. Oh. Uh, so we have 170 certified PGS certified farmers and we are IFORM accredited organization body or IFORM accredited certification body. It's very hard process, but because of our dedication, we uh, became to achieve that goal. So this is our theme. Good for the planet, good for the country, good for you. We are representing good market. Thank you very much for sharing my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me, for giving me this time to be here. Sorry, Sorry I think the presentations are in the different order. So, Paul, you're going to go. Okay, no, you got it. Awesome, you're on it. Thank you. You can keep going. Sorry, Paul. Thank you. I was going to say that. I feel so much privileged to stand before you, to be here to share with you. As you were told earlier, I come from Kenya, uh, East African country, East Africa, part of Africa. So I say thank you to be here and for those who attendants who have come here today and the organizers and Mesa, I say thank you very much to plan this event to happen like this. You know, I know, I understand it's not easy. So I come from Kenya, and as I said, my name is Paul Smiyu. Back at home, they call me Kaka Paul. Kaka Paul means brother Paul. So most of them, they call me Kaka Paul, and even others call me Mr. Soil, because most of the time I like to talk about the soil. So, <laughs> so here, I have passion, in agriculture, I was brought up by my grandmom, and my grandmom is the one who showed me how to farm and how to love agriculture. Yes. Yes. My grandmom is the one who showed me how to do or how to love agriculture. So as you can see here, you may see like I'm in the bush, but not in the bush, I'm in the bush of vegetables. So this is the work that I work in Kenya because of my 
of the passion I have. Sorry. There you go. Yeah. I am blessed with the, I have family, as I said, that is my grandmama, as I said, and also that's my wife, and that's my all family. I have three daughters. Yeah. So I eat traditional food, that's why you see, I might be seem like to be under 20 because of traditional food. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Agriculture in Kenya, when I was young, when I was farming with my grandmom, it was totally different because we used to go in the farm and we used to grow so much food. And the way we used to see people, when I used to see people, they used to grow food. And this food, the type of the pattern that we used to produce food, it really changed completely. Because when I was young, we used to produce food. The time of planting, we used to plant in February. It reached a time then we were planting March. It reached a time then we, April. Now at this moment as I speak, we are planting like May now, early May, sometimes like late April. So the type of the, the pattern of planting has complete, completely changed. And this has been caused by the climatic condition in Kenya. But before I move to that, I would like to talk about the colon, colonization, which has also like, a, it was just, it's just in our, in our brain so much. The roots of the colonization go back to the Berlin Conference in 1885, when East Africa was first divided into territories by England and European powers. That's why most of the time that we see our people, the way we do, the way we farm, the crops that we grow, we can stick on some such kind, some crops, that this is what we want to do, this is what we want to plant, because of the colonization that we have in our brain. So, <clears throat> but agriculture production comes from small scale farmers, like in our place, 75% of agriculture come from small scale farmers. And not even in our country alone, even if you go many countries, small-scale farmers are the ones that are producing too much food for the people or for the country, as you can also see. Then 80% of population are farmers, but still we import some crops. Even if we are farming, like 60% we import outside to the country. Then we have average of 1,160 1, pounds, uh, not pounds, dollars, that is per year, household per year. As I mentioned earlier about the, the drought or climatic change, climatic change has caused so many problems in our places, as you can see. L like those who, who, were, who followed early this year, in our place in Kenya, many people, some people lost their lives. Even animals, especially those pastoralists who rely on animals, they even started to suffer. Others lost their lives because they had nothing to eat. All places was dry. So this developed our people, developed our, uh, made our, our country people to be so much poor because they had nothing to do. Even the country had to spend money to import some food into the country. And those, that money is maybe planned to do something else. So it contributed a lot to our country. Even you see like some animals because they don't, did not have anything to eat. Like you see a picture, a photo of an image of an animal here dying because it ate this. The thatched, uh, the grass which had been used to thatch the house then, it had like some problems then it died because they, there was nothing for the animals to, to eat at all. Then, very difficult in my place, as I speak right now, it's very difficult for a person to access the land or to buy the land because it's very, very, very much expensive. Big companies, they are able to have the land because they have money they can buy. Like I speak here, there's a project that we are setting. We are buying the land, but still it's very much expensive. So in Kenya, it's not easy to have the land, maybe in some areas. 
Then we have what we call, these are the challenges I, I'm, a, I'm trying to address, or to speak about. We also have what we call lack of government regulation and market liberalization harms, harms small scale farmers, food import, imports flood local markets. So liberalization, government reg regulation, because the market is just free. Any person, big companies, corporate, corporates, they can do a lot of farming, then they flood the market. But small scale, when they produce, it's like a problem because now the market is not good. And because now the strategies for the market is not good, when they produce, the produce come together with people from corporates. So they don't have the space, they don't have the place to sell their produce. Now at long last, like small scale farmers are not making any money. They are not enjoying, enjoying at all the fruits of their farming. This is what we are experiencing. But we are trying very hard so that next time or in future or as activists so that we come together because we are planning to set up we are working with what we call Kenya Organic Agriculture Network. Kenya Organic Agriculture Network, I think this one is now the one to save the farmers. Because now it's the one to bring farmers together to create that certification, to create that PGS, participatory guarantee system, to form them. After farmers have been certified, now they can bring, the play, they can bring their staff, their produce to the market to sell because we are now planning to come up with a good, pl good places for the organic farmers to sell their products. I think this is going, to, sa this is going to, to save our people. Then I would like to, to talk about the corporate influence on government, land seeds. You see, in our places, we have big companies. We have Monsanto companies in our places. So this one, when we say we don't want this one, like we say that no GMO in Kenya, because we, like here, I don't know if I have some photos here. We are demonstrating and saying no GMO. But now these big companies, they come to, the, to, the, to our people. They say, no, this is not supposed to be this. Now they influence the, the top people in the government to enact and pass the policies which are now coming to, which are coming to affect the farmers and because they have that big influence in the, in the government. And still they can own the land because they have the, they have the money. They have the money so they can do anything. And still we have top people in the government. They grab the land. And when they grab the land, government cannot do anything because they, they have money and they have influence in the government. We also have an infrastructure. We have an infra infrastructure in our place as a challenge because farmers cannot access or cannot take the produce to the market as it's supposed to be because of the roads and everything. Transportation sometimes becomes a problem. As you can see here, I was working with an organization known as GBAC, and GBAC is to train farmers. And as you can see there, I'm in the class training the farmers because we receive so many farmers from different, count, from different countries, from different parts of Africa. So my work is to train and as you can see the photos, this is the photo after training the farmers. Like here I train farmers, we go to different parts of, of our country to train farmers and I work with the Sisters Association of Kenya and we go to train farmers. I also studied biointensive agriculture, and we have principles of biointensive agriculture, and this is the only way, also one way of trying to heal our, our earth. If we don't do this, then we can't. I have also, I have all these principles, when you follow them, then you will see the fact part of it. I like to work with the children together. I like to train in the communities, as you see. Then I also, we, we have what we call often the, our crops, crops often. The crops often, these are the indigenous food that we, our people have left because they think that these are the crops or the food that belongs to the poor. But now they have come to realize that this is the important 
food that we need to have. So we go to people, then we create that awareness to see the important part of it, important, important part of it to come to the crops again. These are like sorghum, our millet, our sweet potatoes. Thank you. And as you can see, I was also showing, I had also time, I went to Ghana also to talk to people. I went to Ghana to train people. And still, as I'm, I'm here right now, here I'm, I was in Ghana. I was sent in Ghana to train people. And right now, I'm here. This is my second internship. Um, and we have, uh, because I'm so much interested to work with my communities, where I was working is very far from my community. Now I've decided to go back to my community. Now we have started, and a project, and the name of the project is CADEP. That is Communities in Action Development Project Kenya. I'm working with the old women or old people so that we empower them with some project because they support the orphans so that they can be able to support the orphans. I also like to uh, have passion to work with the children because these children, they are less advantaged and most of them are orphans. So this CADEP is the one going to support the orphans, support the orphans to continue with their education. So when I go back, these are the people I'm going to work with and also to work with the communities, to work with the schools, institution, to train them. Right now, as I speak, we have started developing, I have already, we have started to pay the farm. And this farm is the one which we are going to start to develop the projects, like a demonstration garden where people will be coming to learn and where the orphans will be getting food. Because right now I, I have some orphans I live with. So they will be getting food there. We get income from there. And we train also from there. So I also work dehydration, food, aid, food addition, solar, cookers. I train the, my people. I work with the old women, as I said different people, maybe I can read for you one thing. This is from Mandela. Overcoming poverty is not a task of charity. It is an act of justice, like slavery and apartheid. Poverty is not natural. It is man-made, and it can be overcome and eradicated by the action of human beings. Sometimes it falls on a generation to be great. You can be that great generation. Let your greatness blossom. Nelson Mandela. Thank you very much. How's everybody? Okay, can people say soil, not oil? Soil, not oil. Okay, so can we say divest and invest? Because I just wanted to start with like the answer on what we needed to really be doing here, right? We, we must begin to divest from certain things and invest in others, correct? Okay, and you all here are available to know that. I guess, you know, I don't know how to work this clicker thing. Is, is there something up here? Because uh, the image is great, but the action is more needed, is what I want to say. Um, in fact, I'm grateful. Thank you all last minute. Like, you know, hey, Sister B, we, we're talking about liberation, and we need to go beyond diversity and go into liberation. Correct? Soil, not oil. I just want to go there. There's no more soil coming from another planet is what I like to tell the girls when I'm working with them. We got to build this stuff right here. We got to build it up. Okay? Y'all can clap for that too. It's okay. Just felt like the energy was getting a little stale and the planet is heating up and we need to get a little bit excited is what I'm saying. We have to divest and invest in some other things. I grew up in Oakland, Berkeley, and the state of California. My papa was a farmer. 
He would be laughing now if he heard Urban Farmer. He was in Orville, California. This is where I would spend my summers coming from Oakland with parents that were organizing living in the city. So here we are going to Orville, and they were real farmers, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Tomatoes, bell peppers, stuff had to be the store because this was his business and livelihood. Here I come with my little fancy city cell to Orville and my cousins who had the real privilege to live with the grandparents, they said, you know, we got to get up before day. I said, before day? What are you talking about? We got to work the farm. If you don't work, you gonna, you know, you gonna get in trouble. And I'm thinking, okay, I said, we could call CPS. <laughs> you are, we don't have to do this kind of stuff anymore. We are liberated. We don't have to do these things. They said, well, you ain't going to eat. You better get up. I won't go deep in the story. Papa is laughing right now. I say, I say to him, out of all the grandchildren, which was over 20, here I am, have decided to take upon this task of farming. <laughs> Who knew? This girl would have 15 chickens in her backyard in deep West Oakland, huh? Right? <laughs> Talking about she had chickens in her backyard in West Oakland. Who knew? I thought it was slavery. But what I'm grateful for, and I had to open up with that, is the resilience that it gave me. Because though I had the privilege to go to my grandpa's in Oroville, California every summer, I also was a child that grew up in deep East Oakland in the streets where folks were murdered and killed and shot right in front of me. As a part of the oppression and the systematic systems of pipeline to prisons, I also fell subject, and I ain't gonna say fell subject, but I came, became a mother as a teenager. My daughter, like you, I actually have three daughters, 21, 17, and 10. The oldest is finishing up her last year at UC Berkeley. She's an artificial intelligent engineer. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We, we, you know, we work together, you know, we're working on it. <laughs> it's like, I tell people her mother is a farmer. Okay, no matter what she's doing, she knows how to grow her own food. Having these children and myself being a woman who went through so many different adversities, Dr. Joy DeGruy, and if you don't know who she is, she's published a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. I'd like you to get it if you're in the room and you're talking about divesting and investing and wanting to value and make new relationships. Because here's the thing, y'all, we got to get uncomfortable to grow. Seems like we've been just too damn comfortable. I mean, okay, we got any farmers in the room? You know, when you plant a seed or something, if you ever had like a, a time-lapse camera and you watch it like germinating, it's getting ready to pop. Can't you imagine that that shit is uncomfortable coming through the soil? And then just to pop up and hopefully not be in a windbreak somewhere, right? You're blowing and shit like this. And then still continues to grow even if we forget to water. Oh, I'm just saying, because hopefully it's a native. But he, he, here's what I want to say. It's time for us to get uncomfortable so that we can grow, period. So here I am with these three beautiful daughters and I wanna train them on how to take over the world. I want them to know how to grow food. I want them to know how to be outdoors. Cause you have to understand for most folks millenated in America, and I'm speaking from my experience, are traumatized just to go outside, literally. So, so here I am with these young girls because now I've grown up and I don't feel like Papa's work was slavery. Now I feel like I was privileged because I had preserves in the counter. We, we had our own eggs and I was scared to go in the chicken coop as a child. Who knew? I'd be like, we gonna eat those eggs? We can't go to the store? We can't, we, we can't get no Captain Crunch? We gotta eat this stuff y'all grow? Oh my God. Who knew? We gotta grind the meat? You mean we making hog head cheese? from the hogs that was outside, Ugh. I was privileged. We ran around outside in Orville Dam, in the rip, we hung out, we went crawdad fishing, and when I came back to the Bay Area in Oakland, and I walked down the streets of 98th and Cherry and Deep East Oakland, and watched half of the class of folks that I went to school with murdered, watched systematic oppression every single corner you turned around to, I was privileged to be on that farm. I had no idea. I had imagination. That's where resilience started for me. So with that biased intention, I thought, well, when people say, wow, you've done so great with the, you know, you've, you've done so good. I said, you know why? Because my papa was a farmer and my grandmother was a farmer. And this is what they taught us. Even though I, if, they were, if they were living, they'd be laughing. I'm talking about I would hide in the citrus trees so that I wouldn't have to do the work. 
I'm not doing this. In fact, I remember saying, I'm walking to town. We're calling CPS. They can't make us do this. But I was able to draw back on those things. So when my children hit the planet, again, being blessed with little girls and wanting them to have this experience, but then also being caught in the idea of living in the city. Over 20 years ago, um, I helped co-found an organization called the Camp Butterfly is how we started. Let me go there. And what we wanted to do was provide like Girl Scouts for color girls. We wanted our girls to be outside because what you have to understand is that the Girl Scout and the 4-H club is not fit for all. Sorry. Some, I, I hope I didn't hurt nobody's feelings. And for me, my intention was to make sure that my children had the same experience that I had in nature, which really was a blessing. That's what created the resilience. Period. So here we are starting Camp Butterfly. The founder and woman, Niambi Echoes, who wrote the book, we met each other at a holistic festival. She had written a book called the Project Butterfly. In this book, if you can, and this is a quick story, there were all these circles and things that she was facilitating with youth. And she wasn't going in the garden. But these were circles that I was doing with my children, and I was doing it in the garden. Because I said, well, the reason the butterfly is so important to me because of the transformation. Here's a question for you. Do you think if a butterfly knew what it took to be a butterfly, do you think it would go through the process? Hell no. Come on now. You got to die damn near. Anybody know the transformation of a butterfly? But literally, that's what happens in order for us to be able to transform. There's a piece of us. I'm calling on some people in the room because there's transformation needed in this movement. It's going to be uncomfortable. There's pieces of you that you almost have to die back. I mean, think about this, liquefy oneself to only come back and be around for just a bit, not very long, to pollinate. I'm just saying, it's very important, the transformation of a butterfly. That's within all of us as well. We must do that. Say soil, not oil. I just want to keep saying it to remind you why we're here today because we have to go beyond diversity and whereas I'm so grateful for the panel, I want us to jump down and start fish bowling sometime. Ain't no them and us. We're all one. We sit on the same dang on toilet, right? Hopefully it's a compost toilet. I'm not going to go there. So, so I want to give you just this, I guess, this. can we do this video? Will it pop up if we push it? Okay, because the video just brings it all together. And so they gave you the titles. I, I had the privilege of working with Starhawk um, in Bayview Hunters Point, where Star has spent probably over 20 years working in communities that most folks just go get their PhD on. I'm just going to say it like that, OK? We love to get our research <laughs> to put in a document about some people and, their, and what's happening with them. But I'm going to say something about Starhawk. She's still there. She's still working there. Here I was working with a group of beautiful girls because in short, my work biasly is to train young, beautiful, melanated little girls on becoming farm hers. Do you understand me? Like that's the bias goal at the end of the day. <laughs> Call it what you want to. So what we do is we use the ecology to help support with personal development. See, look, everything is in the garden. You start as a seed and there's a seed. You can't go killing people. Just put some campania crops down. You feel me? That's how we got to do. So, so this, is what, this is what we do with the girls. So we talk about conflict resolution. We talk about all life issues. For me, I can relate anything to the garden. We got gourds all around. I'm thinking about the shake of days that we can create for music. Every single thing comes from land. We got to know it. So here we are with this butterfly movement. We offer camps. We do after school programs. So here I am in San Francisco, because here I am on an assignment to work with some beautiful young black girls in Bayview Hunters Point, which I'm going to say to some folks, how many people know where it is? Just raise your hand. Show me. That's much better. By God, I was at the Green Festival, and I said, we're in Bayview. And some people said, where is that? I said, here in San Francisco. Well, where is that? <laughs> that was kind of scary to me, y'all. It's only seven by seven. I just want to, it's only seven by seven. I love the cards. I'm a Toastmaster, so I'm going to wrap it up, okay? I got the one-minute card. 
So what I, I wanted to talk about this idea of permaculture agroecology because I met Starhawk while just working in the garden in San Francisco and she was coming to volunteer. She, here come this woman, I was like, what is this white woman come walking up the hill, who is this? I didn't know her. Yeah, she come walking up the hill and I was cooking because me and the girls every Saturday work in the garden. After we work, we harvest what, and then we cook what we harvest and we have conversation. And here comes this woman walking up the hill. She said, hey, and so we're working and the girls had already knew her. I, I, I didn't know her. They said, oh, that's Star. She come to the garden sometime and bring seeds and stuff. What, what I want to say to this room is that it's time for us to divest and invest. That we can't get together once a year at a panel. You can't, we, we can't just keep giving folks uh, funding for some equipment because we need to pay people. I'm just going to throw it there. I need to train more people to take this over. I'm no good if it's just me with this information. That that's the real liberation and going beyond diversity. Thank you. All right. I'm going to wrap things up here for you guys today. Um, it's been great to hear from the rest of the panelists. It's quite an inspiring group here. Um, and I want to thank Leah for putting the panel together and for the lovely introductions that she gave all of us. Um, I want to spend a couple of moments just telling you a little bit more about my history and how I came to the place I am now. And then I'll get into the meat of what I want to discuss. So I am kind of an accidental farmer. It was not the thing that I intended on doing. I studied uh, political ecology and agroecology uh, during my undergrad at UC Berkeley and um, it kind of became the lens for me through which I could understand the world. Uh, food and agriculture became, I understood it to be the foundation and I under also understood it to be the, the way in which I could understand political injustices that were taking place around the world. Um, and so I spent a little bit of time after college working in the nonprofit sector for Food First and Community Alliance with Family Farmers, uh, getting a feel for, for what it was like to do that kind of advocacy and I ended up feeling like it was really important that I understand farming on the ground a little bit better if I was going to continue doing that work. So I actually left those organizations and I left the Bay Area because I also felt it was really important to understand what was going on in other parts of the country where it's a little trickier to talk about these things. And I moved to Minnesota and uh, did my, my farming apprenticeship on a farm that was a diversified vegetable farm situated right in the middle of corn and soy land. And that's where I learned that the farmers who I had been villainizing for the last couple of years were lovely and wonderful people. If you've ever been to the Midwest, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, and I really began to understand what a perverse system we were all stuck in. Um, I still wasn't planning on becoming a farmer. I really just wanted to have a better understanding of things. But that was in 2008, and we were in the middle of the Great Recession. And so when I came back from my apprenticeship, educated and farmed out and all versed in the nonprofit sector, I, I felt like I'd be able to get a job, but that did not work out. Um, and I realized that, wow, I had this skill set and I actually had access to the three quarters of an acre of land that I had grown up on and maybe I should just give the, get the farming thing a chance and kind of pull my bootstraps. Um, I did that for a couple of years and then I went back to grad school. I took a sabbatical from the farm and went back to grad school to earn a master's degree in urban and environmental policy and planning so that I could, my, my intention in doing that was, was so that I could um, kind of get myself to a place where I could become a bridge between the work that was happening on the ground in farming and the work that was happening in rooms like this, where I felt like um, the, the on the ground reality was not always represented. And so I came back to the farm after finishing up my degree there and I kind of, kind of have ever since been trying to couple this world of agriculture and farming and activism. Um, and it's been pretty challenging. It's pretty hard to do both. It's pretty exhausting, but um, I'm, I'm doing my best. And some of the most recent work that I've been doing off the farm lately looks at two kind of primary issues. The first, thanks Leah, <laughs> the, the first looks at, the first thing that I take a lot, a lot of time, spend a lot of time thinking about are, is gender. This guy right here, right? Uh, gender and women's leadership in the food movement. Um, 
And I'll just take a moment to, the second thing that I've been looking at a lot is land. I'm just gonna take a moment to share that at the end of this month on September 30th, Red H Farm, my farm, is, is going to be hosting a conference celebrating women's leadership in the food movement, the second annual conference held up in Sebastopol. And if you were inspired by Brandy a few minutes ago, which I'm guessing you were, she's going to be joining us that day. We're very excited. So um, there's flyers out front. <laughs> There's flyers out front, and you can talk to me about it after, um, or you can go online and check things out. Uh, but today, considering what's at the core of this conference, this idea that sequestering carbon in the soil is the most logical way forward in the face of climate change, and considering that it's a topic that com has come up in all three of these panelists so far, what I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about is this question of land. Um, the land struggle is a global struggle, and it looks very different all over the world, but the U.S. is no exception. People, farmers here in the U.S., are struggling for land just just as people all over the world are. Um, recently, I contributed a chapter to um, a book that was published by Food First called Land Justice, Reimagining Land, Food, and the Commons in the United States. Uh, it's a really fantastic book. It's a con over 20 authors contributed chapters, and I highly recommend you take a look at it. It's got a lot of perspectives um, on people all over, all over this country who are working on this question of land access and land justice. Um, so I just want to take a, a few minutes to share a bit about the ideas from that chapter. Um, I, th I really have come to believe that it is of the utmost importance that we take a critical look at the relationship between the food movement, land, and this new generation of ecological farmers here in the United States. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the expectations that we have of these farmers, um, this idea that renting land, um, uh, renting land, that young farmers can rent land and, and that that amounts to sufficient access to land. Our relationship to the land, both as a society and especially our expectations around how we want farmers to relate to the land, and what it means when all of those things are situated within the prevailing economic system that we're all a part of. So, that's a repeat of what I just said. <laughs> all right, so. Farmers are really being tasked with a lot these days. Uh, farmers are tasked with being the key environmental stewards of the land and the greater landscapes, acting as the foundation of a transformed food system. Tr farmers are key in creating this particular kind of cultural experience and cultural environment that many of us enjoy here in the United States. And most recently and relevantly, small-scale farmers are being looked to as the driving force and kind of the front lines in climate change mitigation. So when we're talking about carbon sequestration in the soil together, in, in many cases and in many ways, we're talking about farmers and ranchers. Um, and the concerns that I present in the chapter and that I'm going to talk about here really focus on the fact that across the country, in particular on the coasts, like, like here in the Bay Area, regions where land values are very high, the dialogue around land within the context of this new generation of ecological farmers really focuses heavily on supporting farmers and developing strong lease agreements with landowners. With that in mind, I want you to kind of consider the context of this idea of land access in the United States. There's a few points I want to make here. First, we're expecting very high input and high cost ecological farming from these growers. We want growers to be investing in the soil and growing healthy food for, for our families and our communities. The second thing that's important to note is that the health of the land is really like a farmer's investment portfolio. You can certainly uh, see short-term payoffs and economic benefits to ecological farming, but the real payoff is in the long, is in kind of the long game. It's in the deep, integrated, complex, rich landscapes that are built over time. Third, consider, I'd like you to just keep in mind that renting, leasing, and borrowing in the food system is always precarious and unpredictable, and I'm not going to go into any horror stories, many of which you've probably all heard, but you can ask any farmer who's done it. It's always complicated, and it's always a little different uh, than, than, than the expectations that, that are set out at the beginning. And finally, I want you to consider that this support system that we're creating within the food movement, really advocating for leases, focus on uh, minimum three and hopefully five-year leases. That's kind of the goal when you look at organizations that are really focused on, on helping farmers get strong leases. The dialogue sometimes then turns to this idea of long-term leases, uh, which might be something like 20 years, which is kind of a dream for a farmer. However, if a farmer is investing something like five or $10,000 per acre in their land each year to, between 
amendments, labor, compost, things like that. The financial investment over five years is pretty decent. So over 20 years, it gets quite hefty. Imagine that if in year 19, that farmer then learns that their lease is not going to be renewed. And not only has that farmer lost all of the real money that they've put into that land, but they've also lost the time that they've put in, uh, the time that has gone into building that land and building that agro ecosystem. And they lose it without interest gained and with no kind of buyout. That's not how things work in farming when you rent and farmers are set up to start from square one. So I know that many of us in this room, including myself, really seek to change the financial system that we are in. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that right now we are all functioning within this neoliberal capitalist regime, every one of us here. And I would suggest, and this is kind of um, some of the meat of it here, I would suggest that nowhere else in our financial system would we expect someone to make high cost, high risk, short term, low return investments. So we're expecting new farmers to live in little houses and tents and converted garages, to live quintessentially bohemian lifestyles that while they are admirable and perhaps we should all be striving for, are certainly not in step with the broader communities in which these farmers are living. And we're expecting and hoping that farmers will continue to do this for the greater good. I would suggest in light of this that as a community and as a social movement that we all really need to take a step back and think about our relationship to land and in a system based on private property, think about who should own that land, how we can turn farming into a public good or a public utility, and how we all can relate to that land in a different way. How can we create a system in which farmers not only have access, but also have ownership over the land that they steward, whether that be privately in community through utilizing community land trust models, public-private partnerships, through truly reimagining and developing a commons? A farmer colleague of mine's landlord referred to herself as a benevolent dictator. And I can tell you, knowing all the farmers that I know, that that kind of building a system on that kind of mindset is not going to work for this community. So in short, my concern is that as a movement, we're actually building a house of cards, a system that's reliant on a group of young folks that we're hoping will continue to feel satisfied living these bohemian lifestyles, not having kids, not saving for retirement, joking about the last time we went to the dentist. And many of these folks are quite educated and could, do have other options and could go find jobs off the farm, but are doing this work because they love it, we love it, and believe in it. As a movement, I think we need to take a good, long, hard look at what it is that we're building and whether or not we are actually reinstating some of the very structures that we seek to change in the industrial system into the food movement itself as we relate to land. The fact of the matter is the value that our society places on food is never going to justly pay for the ecological production of that food. I think we all know that. So we have to decide what we want farmers to do. Do we want farmers to produce good food efficiently so that farmers can make a living wage and pay a living wage to their workers? Do we want farmers to save the world from uh, the pending chaos of climate change? Do we want farmers to carefully steward the land and the landscape so that we have healthy functioning ecosystems for generations to come? If we want farmers to do all of these things, to hold up our communities and our landscapes in that way, then I think we need to collectively and concertedly figure out how exactly we are going to hold up farmers. And I'll just close by saying that this this notion that Brandy reiterated to divest to invest is I think exactly what we have to think about. So I think we're out of time for questions, unfortunately, again. Um, but I really encourage everyone to come up and, and we're seated over in the middle and, um, and come talk to these amazing speakers while they're here. Um, and I think um, the, next, the next, are we having somebody else come up? Okay, breakouts, okay. So wait, do we wanna do questions then or no? No, okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Let's give a huge round of applause to these amazing leaders.